Hi, I'm Camille Moorhart. Thanks for joining me for a conversation on confidence with three absolute superstars. I have with me Michelle Johnston Holdhouse, who's Executive Vice President at Intel, and Sheila Glazier, who's Chief Financial Officer at Zendesk and also a former Corporate Vice President at Intel, and Leslie Culbertson, a former Executive Vice President at Intel, who's now retired after a 40-year-long career. For over 30 years, she led various finance organizations at Intel, as well as multiple groups in the technology manufacturing group. She also headed human resources and Intel's product assurance and security division. So really uh, happy to have all three of these absolutely stellar ladies on the call today. So um, Sheila, what do you think confidence is to you? Sure, yeah, so Camille, when I think of confidence, I think a lot about courage. And I think about um, having the courage to be really bad at something, to be able to start to be really good at something. And um, I just think through my career, yeah, I was at Intel for 29 years. Uh, lots of times I was in situations where I had no idea how to get done what I was trying to get done, but I had the courage to ask for help. And then I had the courage over time to offer help to people. And to me, being a little bit uncomfortable, you know, that stepping into courage, it doesn't mean that you're not afraid of things, but you have confidence that you'll learn them. I'm in a role right now. I've never been a public company CFO, but I had the courage to, you know, take that leap and really ask for help and allow myself to not be very good at it to begin with, because that's the way to build your confidence over time. Um, let's jump to you, Michelle. What? How would you define confidence for yourself? Yeah, I love what Sheila, Sheila said, because I do think it takes so much courage because we have so many external forces that are constantly pushing on us to check whether or not we should have that self-confidence. I think at the end of the day, it comes in really to your core. Like, do you believe in yourself? Are you willing to take risks, to learn, to be uncomfortable, as Sheila said, to ask for help and to put yourself out there? and to try new things. Um, because every experience we have kind of fills your piggy bank, right? And then every negative experience you have take away from it. And so I think you just have to keep going and you have to keep filling your piggy bank and you have to be willing to be vulnerable. You have to be willing, as Sheila said, to fail. And you have to be willing to pay it forward because everyone across the industry, from the most successful to the least successful, no matter where you are on that scale, in your personal view, struggles. And they need confidence and they need others to help pick them up, to push them forward, to tell them that they can do it. So it's not just as much about reflection on yourself, but reflection of how you show up in the industry, how you show up with your peers and the encouragement that you give them moving forward. And uh, Leslie, how would you define confidence? I guess I was trying to reflect on my, uh, you know, my career plus you know, growing up. Um, and I realized that I got a lot of my self-assurance, I guess I'll call it that, and my confidence came from my parents. I was short and my parents made me play tennis. I did play in high school and I played in college. And I think the things they had me do helped build my confidence. Uh, oh, I know where I'm good. I know where I'm bad, right? You know, when you're, the tennis net is at your arm shoulders. And the people on the other side of the net are 5'11". I don't know. It was not a really good experience sometimes. <laughs> but I knew what I was good at. And I played the game I could play. And I won enough that, you know, it helped me build confidence. And I think throughout my career, I've been really lucky to Michelle's point. The giving it back, I had good role models. When you work for leaders or even managers, who see things about your capability and what you can deliver and how you get things done and how you behave every day, they give you more. And the more you seem to get, the more confident I became in what I could do. And you're right, I took jobs at Intel that why would someone want me to run, you know, the cartridge thing? People don't know what that is, but anyway. Or to worry about, um, you know, boards and systems manufacturing in the production end. So people gave me things that they thought I could learn, as Sheila would say, you listen, you ask for help, you surround yourself with people who actually know a level of depth and detail that you don't, and you listen and you learn, and then you help provide 
leadership and direction because people have helped me. So it's important to give back. I would look at any one of you and think you were just kind of born with the confidence and like easy for you to say like, oh, okay, you know, you, you have to fail and that's great. And then you get back up. It's like, well, it's very easy for you to say, you know, with the titles you have and the things you've done. But I'm wondering, I, you know, Michelle, I don't know if you could maybe share some time where that wasn't easy or, you know, you didn't come out of the gate that way. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting that that is your perception because I think the best leaders and the most confident leaders have failed a lot because you have to figure out how to pull yourself back up because I just want to be completely transparent. No one has a career that's failure less, if I can say that word. I mean, it's your whole life you're going to have failures. I mean, I can think of, you know, from the time I was in elementary school when I wanted to do things that I couldn't do to... You know, today, I feel like there's days I fail my people. I fail my customers. Um, we don't deliver on time. There's so many examples. And I guess, I think for me, the key difference is, do those failures hold you back, make you more reserved, make you maybe stop trying? Or do those fuel kind of that inner sense of pride and confidence to continue to move forward? And I truly believe that is a differentiator between a lot of executives and that if you can fail, learn from it, and charge forward with even more confidence than you had before you failed, those, I think, are the leaders um, that tend to persevere, particularly in some of these tougher fields. And for all of us, I mean, we're all women in a very male-dominated um, organizations and, you know, industry. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to be able to pick yourself up, and you've got to figure out um, – what fuels you? And that's different for every person, but you need to figure out like, what is it that makes your motor go? And so for me, fear of failure is a great motivator, great motivator. And it's not something that paralyzes me. It's something that when I see that, or I feel that I like double down. So if you're like in a sport, you would do daily doubles. If you think you're not going to make the team, you'd practice extra hours because you want to make sure that you succeed in that goal. And it's the same in life outside of work or life at work. You got to give it sometimes extra. Sometimes you have to put in more hours, but that feeling of success after failure, there's nothing like it. So how do you pick yourself up rather than move into that, like you said, reserved or more guarded space? Like how, how do you take that, that jump or that leap? So I take it because I have a great network of people that when I'm really frustrated or I'm struggling that I can reach out to and I can have that conversation with. And some of it I think is just me and my personality and that I hate to fail. I am extremely competitive for anyone who knows me. And there's just an inner drive to do that. But we all have bad days, weeks, months. Hopefully you don't have bad years. Um, that's a long time. Uh, but I have found that there are people within my networks that when I am struggling are happy to answer the call, talk me through it, help change my perspective. You know, um, a lot of times we like to say, until now, I haven't been successful, but today is a new day. Um, and sometimes it's just a shift in the way that your mindset is or the way that you're thinking. And I can tell you that the two wonderful uh, peers and partners on the phone, Leslie and Sheila, have taken many of those phone calls from me when I've been frustrated to help pick me back up and get me focused on what I need to be doing to be successful. Well, let me ask uh, Sheila. So are you, is kind of your sense of self-assurance or confidence, is it even across all things, all areas of your life or your profession? Or are you like really confident, I would imagine maybe in finance, but less confident in, I don't know what, marketing or something else? Yeah, I would say kind of my approach and I'm in a new company. So like literally absolutely everything is new. The people are new, the industry is new, the company is new. Um, so I kind of approach things though in a common way. Like how do I build on what I know? And then how do I build a network of people that might be able to help me? And I've done that really all my career. I've actually done that really all my life, right? Um, who are the people that can help? Which is why asking for help, it's it's uncomfortable asking for help. I'm asked Michelle and Leslie for help all the time and I'm happy to give them help, but 
it starts with that. So like even, you know, me starting at a new company, I've started to build a network of people I can ask those, you know, embarrassing questions to like, what are we talking about when we're talking about SaaS? What do we really mean? What are we really selling to people? You know, these questions that seem like, well, doesn't everybody know the answer to that question? Well, actually, no, nobody's bored knowing the answer to the question. At Intel, how do you manufacture silicon? Okay, nobody was bored knowing the answer to that question. But I bet you there's somebody in Ann Kelleher's organization that could help explain that to somebody who needed to know. So it starts with that curiosity and then building a network of people that really you can be a, a um, asset for them and they can be an asset for you. And so I think about, I always think about um, like, how do I build my, my circle large enough so I can help, um, help understand things so I can help solve more problems. We don't talk about the bad things that happen in our career. That's why people think you're born a baby. Michelle was a baby and then she became an executive at Intel. Like that's our narrative about Michelle or Leslie or me because the middle part never gets discussed. But, but the thing that always helps me and another colleague of ours, Aisha Evans always says, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one with yourself. That's also some of how you think about like, how do I build confidence in this area or how do I get to know this area? Have a one-on-one -on -one with yourself. Like, what are the things you know? What are the things you don't know? And how do you build a plan for yourself to, to understand those things? And I love Brene Brown. There's a line that she has, which is about the story I'm telling myself. And a lot of times the reasons we think we can't do something is we're describing a story to ourselves, which limits ourselves. So get a new voice in your head right? That voice in your head that's telling you the next step, fire that voice and get a new voice. Because the story you're telling yourself is sometimes just a story. It doesn't mean that's what's true. And so to me, I try to push through those things and I would encourage people to push through those things. And especially if you think about in this virtual world, you can have a coffee with anybody you want in this virtual world. You, your network can be infinite right now. So feel comfortable to do that. And that's how I build confidence in areas because I build insight and I build a network of people who are there to help, help me um, learn and grow. So one of the things I'm kind of interested in is you're saying, you know, fire the bad narrative in your head, but what if that, what if you're being told things um, you know, on the job. So it's not coming from you. You're being given advice and <clears throat> you don't know, you know, there's a certain amount of, you know, who am I listening to? Or, you know, I have my own leadership style and maybe I'm not appreciated here or this manager doesn't understand me and I need to go do something else versus I should listen to what's being said and try to improve. And I'm wondering you know, how to walk that line. And Leslie, I'm wondering if you would be willing to share um, the advice you got, <laughs> I think on a performance review many years ago, when you kind of struggled with that, how should I take this? Um, can you tell us that, that story and what you did with it? <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, at that time, you know, we had focal reviews, right, as everybody knows, and I got some feedback from Bob Reed, who was the, uh, CFO before Andy Bryant. And the words in my review were, Leslie needs to have more stature and presence. And I uh, thought, well, stature is kind of hard. I'm only 4'11". Hmm. Don't think I'm growing anymore. You know, I missed... so I had these whole crazy things in my head about what do those words mean? So, you know, you look them up, you think about what you're doing. And I did struggle a lot. Because, you know, my first one, the, the stature, I, I, that was a physical thing to me. I couldn't, you know, even deal with that. What does that mean? Higher heels? I don't know. Anyway, so, but presence was important. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about my presence, presence at the table, my effectiveness. Am I not being effective? You know, I went through all these different things. I made huge lists of my own behavior and thinking about, was I ineffective? Um, am I not doing the right analysis? Am I not listening? Like I need to really listen to what people are saying. And oftentimes maybe I was coming forward with solutions that weren't solving the problem, right? So I actually spent a lot of time uh, talking to Andy Bryant <laughs> to, to say, help me dissect this. I mean, what do you see about me? 
And Andy Bryant is former CFO at Intel and also former chairman of the board at Intel. And clearly there were some things that he was very good at letting me know. Adorable man, no, really a genuine nice guy. But somehow or other there were days, no matter what I said, it all sounded the same to him. Even though I was trying to explain something, I realized I was not being effective with that person and I needed to be effective. And not in an efficient way, in a way that he would embrace me and use me. Does that make sense? Because I wasn't making it happen. And it took me a while, I had to change. Maybe it's the voice in the head that I changed about the narrative I've been using and how I was dealing with him, but my presence with him was one where Andy directed me to go rethink how I was coming across. Was I being effective? Was I adding value to his role? Was I making his life better, right? Was I solving the right problems? Because at Intel, you've got to be accountable and you've got to be able to deliver. So you've got to figure out that that whole entire personality <laughs> has to work in a positive way, right? So that I was being effective and efficient and presence of how I presented myself and what I was doing had to change. And so that was very helpful, but it took me a while to get to the bottom of me. Does that make sense? And what I needed to change, not what he needed to change, right? It wasn't about them. It was about me. Well, I want to, I kind of want to tread on it like another area that's sort of parallel to that, which is um, I know, Michelle, you had retweeted an article um, that came out in the Harvard Business Review. Um, I think it was February of this year. And um, the authors were saying, hey, OK, enough with the imposter syndrome. You know, we're sort of labeling something that really is just a normal human tendency. Everybody goes through times of feeling hesitant or unsure of themselves. And we shouldn't you know, label that and say, especially when we say women usually are the ones that have this problem with imposter syndrome or underrepresented minorities have this issue, right? This is a syndrome. Um, instead, we really need to look at the environments that we're providing and the atmosphere that we're providing. Um, and I want to know your perspective on kind of the balance between those two things, because to some degree, each person owns their own career and development. And understanding when to, you know, listen to somebody and, and look into it and when to sort of say, okay, this is, you know, this is not my problem. <laughs> this is something I need to walk away from. So could you, um, Michelle, offer some perspective there? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So let, let me maybe start with the article that you referenced in imposter syndrome. I, I guess I want to, I don't like the word, but I do want to also make sure everybody understands it doesn't matter how successful you are. I don't care if you're LGBTQ, you're a woman, you're a white male, you're an underrepresented minority. Everyone has some version of whatever you want to call imposter syndrome. I think there's some key differences though. I think some audiences want to talk about it a lot more, want to express how they're feeling with their peer group so they can move forward. And I would say there's ever other demographics where they just don't have those conversations or if they do, they're in a much smaller group. So as you think about your the feedback that you've gotten. So when Leslie said her two things, I thought there's one thing that she can address in that feedback. And the way I would have gone about that feedback, I love the way she did it was, you know, stature, I would have said, well, there's not really much I can change about stature but I can change the other things. And she went and listened. And I also say something that's often not super popular with my boss, but I also say there's a point where you have to vote with your feet. And what I mean by that is there should be fundamentals to your values, irregardless of if it's your personal life or your career that you stick to. And there can be a point where you are in a great job and you're doing a wonderful job, but you get feedback and you go through that listening and learning process and you determine that maybe this isn't the right spot for me. Like what need, what's needed to be done to move forward doesn't align with who I want to be, what my passion areas are, or maybe my, even my own principles. And that doesn't necessarily mean that what they're asking you to do is wrong. It just means those aren't the values and the things that I 
find important or that I want to measure myself against. And I think after you've had that intense scrutiny of asking clarifying questions, trying different things to get on the right path, making sure that you're an excellent listener, um, because that, I think, at the end of the day, is the most important skill that every human being has. And then you get to the fourth point, which is if you've done all those things really well and you can't find a place for yourself where you're at and in that particular group, organization, company, committee, church, you know, whatever it is in your life, that's where I think you have to go back and you have to make personal decisions for yourself. But I think before you make those, feedback is a gift but it can also be really hard to hear. And I say all the time to my sales and marketing teams that, you know, you are given two ears and one mouth. So please show up like a mouse with really big ears and a really little mouth versus an alligator with really little ears and a really big mouth. Because I will say just based on the people I've coached and the experiences that I've had, most of the time, in my opinion, the people who have really struggled to find a different way to have the conversation that Leslie talked about didn't take the time to truly listen to the feedback and to unpeel that onion enough to really understand what that feedback meant. They just got so frustrated or they wanted so many examples and they wanted to have that debate back and forth and back and forth that they were never really listening to internalize the feedback. They were listening to figure out how to argue the other half of the feedback. And I would, my coaching would just be, if that is the way you approach it, even when you move organizations, companies, whatever, you're probably going to run right back into that same set of feedback. So if you do see that happening as a consistent um, element of feedback in your career across different groups, as difficult as it can be sometimes, maybe you need to get a coach, maybe you need to get a group that you can have as a sounding board. But I really think that's when you have to look in the mirror and say, there's something fundamental to me that isn't coming across the way that I think I'm, I'm presenting myself. And I need to take the time to really understand that. Because I think, honestly, when managers give you feedback or coaching, no one wants to give tough love. No one wants to give negative feedback. And when they do take the time, it's generally for a good reason. So if you can start with that mindset, it might be a little easier to listen. You mean there's an indication that you're valued if somebody's willing to actually take the time to tell you something that's hard to hear. It's much easier as a manager to just say, no, everything's pretty good. But if they're trying to tell you something, it means they want to see you take on more. And so they're actively working to help you. Is that My best coaches have given me the toughest feedback. They're the ones who challenge me the most. They're the ones who push me to do things that maybe I didn't think were possible. Um, but I've always appreciated having had those conversations myself that no one will take the time to give you tough feedback if they don't want to see a turnaround. They'll either just walk you out the door or they'll just let you scoot on by. But people who are managers or leaders um, who take the time to invest in you and to give you that feedback, they're doing it for a reason. They see something in you. So if you can ch change that mindset of that feedback is about what they see in you and that they want something good for you, it becomes a lot easier to listen and to be, I think, objective about the feedback. Leslie, uh, you've also had a, a whole bunch of different roles, actually, um, going from you know manufacturing to human resources and whatnot. I'm wondering if your confidence over four decades, did it ever, ever um, kind of ebb and flow, or did you feel like it was kind of a steady increase over time the more tasks you took on successfully? It ebbed and flowed. <laughs> I mean, there were some jobs that years ago, Intel couldn't get the CPU in a package. We had to go to these cartridges. We had to put up service mount, like board lines all over the place. Ireland was full of them, etc. And I can still remember when they came to me and said, we need you to um, manage all the material associated with this new CPU. I looked at people, I said, there's no way, I can't. Uh -uh. Are you kidding? I, I'm on the, um, I do boards, right? Where DPM levels were whatever, off the charts, right? Compared to what a CPU needed to be. And I said, I, I can't, I don't have the engineers for that kind of thing. I'm, wow, I'm really 
And it was really interesting, the feedback I got from Splinter and then from um, the head of materials. He said, no, you have to do this. There is no one else. It won't get done. If you don't, if we don't have you leading and getting it done. So some people believed in me. And I was shaken because there's a big difference between motherboards and a CPU and the quality and the engineers and the whole thinking around it. And they said, but we're afraid that we won't be able to deliver if, you, if we don't have somebody from the other side of the house take this on and know that you have to do it in a short period of time and whatever. So people trusted me, but they were really gracious about making sure I was surrounded by the right technical people. So because of that, we were able to persevere, if that makes sense. We were able to get it out on time. Um, I wasn't relying necessarily on my own team. It was a combination of folks across the company. And we actually got it done and got it out. And the CPU was about this big. <laughs> um, and there were lots of funny things about it. So there have been jobs that I've taken where I didn't feel I had the confidence. Uh, but I was lucky enough, even in the product security role, to have the right technical people around me to help me make um, good decisions. Um, I could uh, sort through the risks, the pros and the cons, and the positives and the negatives, and the risks we were going to take, and whether these risks made sense or not. And it's because of the people that I was able to work with across the company. Um, I had enough leadership skills that I could actually do the assessments and we would group together and make decisions, and it worked. To Sheila's point, working together to solve a problem, it's asking those probably, I think we refer to them as those easy but hard questions that you know you get answered and you realize, okay, we can solve this problem. Um, and the product security thing was something very similar. And again, I would never have gone from HR to that. <laughs> Right, if Brian hadn't asked me, it just wouldn't have happened. So yeah, I think part of it is having the right people sur that you're surrounded with who can help you lead. Do you guys, so you and Michelle had both actually mentioned listening as one of the most important skills. And I've found that to be the case. Like when I'm in a room with executives, it seems like the executives listen the most I'll say kind of on down, right? So I've noticed that people often, maybe not always, but often people who rise up tend to really pay attention closely. And I'm wondering, is there, um, is there kind of a format or a process that any of you use to try to step back and like you're saying, either ask a simpler question or look at something from a broader perspective? Is there something you remind yourself like during meetings or does it just come naturally, whatever you ask? <laughs> well, I'll let Sheila answer that one. Yeah, so, you know, in the old days, remember when we used to have commutes? Um, I used to always kind of think about as I came to work, like, you know, think about my day and think, how do I need to show up? Am I in this meeting to just be appreciative of good work? Am I in this meeting, we have a problem and we're gonna be in problem solving mode? Am I in this meeting and we're, we need to make a decision? So, I mean, it starts with thinking a little bit ahead about what's needed in that meeting, what's needed from you in that meeting. And um, I do think a lot about, and Leslie was talking about it, Leslie and I both worked for Andy Bryant for a long time. And it was think about the simple, hard questions. You know, like what problem are we trying to solve? That's a really good question to start off with. And it elicits, sometimes you'll find in a room that there's more ideas about what the problem is than there are people in the room. So of course, it's gonna be difficult to align on a solution if we don't even quite agree on a problem. So that's always a good one. And it also helps to listen to the different voices because depending on um, role and discipline, sometimes people have different views of the problem. Um, and that's important because, you know, problems are usually complex monsters. You know, they don't just show up as sort of like one size fits all. They might have a lot of tentacles into other things. So I think that's usually important. And I'm gonna offer this one thing. Um, we did this thing, I, when was it last summer? We did these things with Jennifer Garvey Berger. I've made a lot of my team watch this thing called mind traps because you realize sometimes you come to the conversation with your mind trap. Like, it doesn't matter what anybody's going to say, you're going to say blue. 
And it's like, actually, people weren't even talking about colors. So why you said blue is like your own internal mind trap. And I find even watching that, like I now watch it maybe once every other month. Um, the mind trap one, it helps me remind myself that I need to come very open to discussions and really listen to learn. Listen to learn, listen to understand. And um, a lot of times, I think in the past, I would be listening to critique or to you know, point out the flaw in the argument, that's not super helpful to teams that are trying to solve a problem. And it also doesn't set them up for being able to solve a problem on their own next time because it sets it up a little bit like I'm the answer person. And the great thing about my new job is everybody knows I'm not the answer person, right? I know I'm not the answer person, they know. But this idea of you know, challenging your own mind trap about how you show up, I think really helps in that listening to learn. So I would encourage people, it's maybe like 10 minutes, a little 10 minute um, YouTube, and it's really helpful. And so I think, you know, sitting with yourself and knowing how you're going to show up and making sure you regulate yourself is one of the most important things. And I do agree with your comment that at executive levels, um, that's one of the big keys that they can help unlock a lot of value for the company by just listening to the experts who have spent hours and hours and hours and hours thinking about this problem. While that executive has a million things to think about, that expert maybe is really spent lots of hours. And so that's a big unlock, listening to somebody who comes with that background. That's interesting. So Michelle, I just wanna ask you then, how do you, um, since you also pointed out the listening, how do you balance um, listening to learn, like Sheila said, with negotiating and understanding your perspective, what, what you want and what you're coming in with. I still think it's listening for action, even in negotiation, because when I go in and I'm listening, so I think about two things. Um, somebody spent a lot of time to bring in the information if they're coming to me for a decision. So how do I respect the work that they have by listening, actively listening and trying to learn? Um, you know, from their hours of research. That's one. Two, often when I say something, no one else will ask questions, right? Because if Michelle's kind of already put her opinion out there, then that's the direction we're going. And I think that doesn't necessarily foster great debate. And then when I'm with a customer and I think about negotiation, the listening is really listening and then asking probing questions because in a negotiation, you're trying to find a win-win. I always say sales is about finding a win-win between solving the customer's problems and allowing their business to flourish and selling something that allows our business to flourish. And when those two things aren't aligned, you don't have a customer for the long term. And so it's about asking those probing questions, really understanding the problems they're trying to solve, sometimes taking longer to close a deal to be able to have those um deep, inquisitive conversations. Because at the end of the day, I think whether it's a customer, whether it's a partner, whether it's an employee, people want to feel like they're heard, that you understand the problem or their suggestion, that you can then, whether even if you tell them yes or no, you can explain it in a way that shows that you fully listened and understood what they told you. Um, and I think that capability is one of the reasons you do see more and more of that, I think, in executives because we're called on to make tough decisions every day. And if you just shut everything down, no one's going to want to work for you. No one's going to want to engage with you. But if you tell someone no to something they've worked, you know, maybe a lifetime on, but you can explain the whys and maybe give them an alternative way to think about it or an alternative path for which to move forward on, it helps. And so I, I, I guess I kind of view Every time you go into a meeting, it is a negotiation. Somebody's asking for something most of the time and you're responding. And I think we all have those experiences in our past where you say that was a really great experience. I learned from it, even when you didn't get the answer that you wanted, but you felt respected, you felt heard and you felt appreciated. That's why I guess what I strive to do every day. And that's why for me, Listening is such an important element and I'm all super direct. Some days I do it really, really well. And some days I'm not so good at it, right? Because you are preoccupied with so many other things. And so that purpose of going into a meeting and understanding or going into a negotiation or any discussion and understanding the role you play and trying to set aside your mind traps or biases so that you can truly listen is, uh, it's, it's a, it's a key skill and a, and it's something I try to improve every day because I don't think you're ever done developing your listening skills. 
do you guys focus on yourselves and like you, there's been a lot of discussion around how to improve yourself and make sure that you're listening carefully and respecting other people um how much of your effort goes into your peers um or even superiors and kind of trying to encourage them to do that as well maybe i'll use an example of you know running communications tara and her team often give feedback after you know activities like this or after an all employees meeting or um you know an open forum and one of the conversations she and i've had a lot about which is how much feedback can any one person take at one time so there may be seven things that we'd like to see done differently from this meeting to the next one. But what are the most important three? What are the three that are gonna make a, mar a remarkable difference in the next time that we show up? So I think it's gotta be bite size. I think you also have to understand that not everyone has the same skills, but I'll just say with my direct staff, um, so let's just say I'm speaking and someone interrupts, we'll try to say, hey, you know, can you allow so-and-so to speak or, um, or if I haven't heard from someone in a conversation, I might say, hey, Brad, you know, what's your opinion on the subject? I know you have one, but we haven't heard from you. Part of listening is also seeing who's part of the conversation and sometimes maybe who's dominating the conversation. And sometimes dominance can be a sign of confidence, can also be a sign of lack of confidence. But to get to good decisions and to be a good listener, I think you have to hear all viewpoints. So some of that is asking others maybe to stop and asking others to join um, into the conversation as well is super important. Um, so which one resonates more with you? Let's see, um, Leslie and Sheila, tell me which one resonates more? Uh, is it being vulnerable and open and transparent about kind of your failures and your faults as you're coming up grows your confidence? Or is it fake it till you make it. And eventually, you know, if you're doing things right, you'll be there or a third option if there's a third. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm not a big fake it till I make it person, I guess, <laughs> a different generation. Um, I, I actually believe on, on my job was my view. Someone was paying me money to do a good job and to make good decisions. And um, I think I'm supposed to be delivering something, right? And if I'm not clear on what I'm supposed to deliver and when, then it would be confusing. But it, as I went up through Intel, I always knew what my deliverables were, how I needed to show up every day, right? And so I never felt I was fake it till I make it. That's not even, <laughs> I, I mean, I needed to deliver every day. Uh, Andy Bryan used to say, if you're not making your paycheck every day or whatever he used to tell us, then you haven't done your job. I want to harken back a little bit to Andy Grove. Andy would always say, you never know that the decision you made is the right decision until much later, right? Whether you should build a fab, whatever the big decision is. And I would remember watching that man, and this is the listening person, He'd already made a decision, but he would have all these technical people come in and he would sit there and he would listen to all kinds of arguments about why that wasn't a very good decision. And so I think it, that listening thing is really a growth thing. And I know everybody until Hayes constructed confrontation, but that's how it got started. He wanted the controversy. He wanted everyone to load up and be in the meeting and help make every decision better because he knew you won't know whether that big decision you're making was right or not till later. So I, I think it's my job. I always felt that I needed to earn my way and I need to know exactly what my deliverables were, when they were due and how to make it happen. It was that, you know, be accountable every day, show up and deliver. You know, you have to have the courage to be bad at some things. The only way you get good at th some things is to start by being bad. And you might even have to suck at it. Um, and you should just be okay with that because there's very few people in the world that are instantly great at things, which I think is where the fake it till you make it comes into play because you think about like sports figures, you know, they don't just, you know, they're not in the crib making three points. 
Um, they practice and practice and practice, and they take a lot of shots and they miss a lot of shots, which is why they make so many shots. So I think in a way you have to have the courage to be vulnerable, but to push through that and to know that if I start off being bad at something, even sucking at something, I can get better. You know, I have the courage that I can get better. And I know that I'm going to surround myself back to, you know, Leslie and um, Michelle's conversation. I'm going to surround myself with people that can help me. I'm going to make sure I've got my coach. I'm going to make sure I've got my, you know, cheerleader. I'm going to have all those people around me to help. And sometimes those are people are inside the company. Sometimes there's outside the company. Sometimes they're living in your same house with you, those people. And I think in a way... Um, when we only want to do stuff we're really good at, we really limit our growth potential. And so I would just encourage people to take the risks, you know, be, be okay being really bad at something because that's the only way you're going to get really good at something. Thank you, all of you, for joining. Um, Michelle Johnston Holthouse, Sheila Glazier, and Leslie Culbertson, I've really enjoyed the conversation today and appreciate your time and thoughtfulness.